I have an interesting job at the moment. I load endovascular grafts into delivery systems. And I'm fairly new at the job, so I'm doing some of the easier ones. So the system, the grafts that I load into systems are mostly iliac systems, which are for the arteries down here. So when I get more clever, I get up into some other areas where the, the grafts become quite a bit bigger. And then the grafts that they design that go into your aorta and the thoracic areas, who knows how large they are in diameter? Can anyone show me how large that might need to be in order to successfully pump that blood around your heart, from your heart and around your body? That big? Nope. Pardon? 20 mil? Nope. Nope, bigger than that. Not 200. <laughs> They're about the size of my wrist. Some are bigger. There is a lot of force at the moment, every second that your heart is manufacturing to get that blood through your aorta. These grafts are huge. And the trouble you have to go to in order to put something that big, full of wires, and about this long, that has adjoining pieces that go from here around a curve to here to here to here to here, it's enormous. And the delivery systems are just incredible. There's wires everywhere, all sorts of things. I have a few people at work that I talk to, and I love working with them. And one of them has told me I have to mention her name because she's going to watch it online. Isn't she crazy? Um, the, her name's Maria. And Maria's one of those people that if I'm having a really chaotic day, I can go and tell Maria, and Maria's pretty chaotic herself, but she will sit me down and she will give me a different perspective. And she will help create some calm in the middle of chaos just by caring. Do you have people like that? When things get chaotic, sometimes in our lives we have those people that can create calm from nothing. It's incredible, isn't it? I want to quickly look at the history of a place in Asia Minor, I guess it's called, called Ephesus. Can you raise your hand for me if you were here for Kendall's and Annalise's sermon on Ephesus? There's a few of you. Okay, so I've teed Brad up to do a bit of a Google search. So those of you who've got your phones and all sorts of other cellular devices, you can do this too. So here we are. Just type in Ephesus. We're going to go to maps. And there's the Ephesus Archaeological Museum. And look at that. Just west of that is the ANZ Guest House, your product placement. And the Temple of Artemis. Lots of people talk about the, the Temple of Isis, but the Temple of Artemis is one of the oldest temples in the town of Ephesus. Currency in about 600 BC as representative tokens, these are the earliest examples of this currency called electrum, little pellets of metal that they mined are found at the Temple of Artemis, at the base of her statue. They found masses of it. So this place, Ephesus, is where a lot of people decided they were going to get what they needed out of life. It's where they wanted to go to turn the chaos into order. And so what they would do is they would bring their gifts, they would leave them at the Temple of Artemis. Artemis was a, a goddess who um, did all sorts of interesting things, mostly firing arrows and hunting and so on. But it was said that she liked to create a bit of chaos herself. So in as much as you would go and leave your pellets of electrum that represented whatever earnings you had and, and goods and so on at this temple, you would hope that Artemis wouldn't lose it 
and accidentally fire an arrow into one of your children when they were born, because she used to apparently be there when you gave birth to your children. She apparently has a twin named Apollo, and she was there when he was born. I have twins. I don't know how one of them would have helped the other one come out, to be honest, but apparently that's what happened. <laughs> Artemis helped, and she was a twin. So this was how you created some sort of order out of chaos, but there were no guarantees. Does this sound like a successful arrangement to you? Would you put up some money for this yourself? Here's a goddess who said, if you, give, if you bring, if you sacrifice, I will create order unless I'm having a bad day. This is pretty... Pretty difficult, isn't it? In this period of time, when the book of Ephesians or the letter of Ephesians was written, Ephesus was a pretty chaotic place. They'd moved from that 6 BC, 600 BC sort of goddesses and so on. There were some mixtures. They'd had a heap of wars. These were the Ionians and there were the Lydians up in the mountains that would come down and they would all fight and carry on. And then the Romans came in and took over from that. It is hard to know what you believe when everybody else is believing something different. True? Yes. And you would have first-hand experience of that. So the chaos in Ephesus was pretty extreme. And I found a relevant world, I guess, that I wanted to talk about with you. And some of you will be familiar with this universe, trying to find the age groups. Anyone watch anything DC or Marvel? Hands? Oh, good, good. Okay, you can help me out. So the DC universe, is it a really bright, happy place? No, it's not. It's gone dark, hasn't it? It is terribly chaotic. So I'm going to read out some people, and I want you to tell me their weaknesses, because in the DC comic world, for those of you who don't know, there are some interesting influential characters, but they all have their flaws. So we're going to start with Superman. What is Superman's Achilles heel? Kryptonite. Kryptonite. Isn't this ridiculous? I ask you Bible questions and you sit quietly, but I can ask you about Superman and you fire up. Okay. What about Batman? What is Batman's weakness? This is a harder one. Pardon? I can't hear. Maths. Bats. Yes, he hates bats. I think his other weakness is he's just a man as well. He's just a bloke. Okay, what about Wonder Woman? What is Wonder Woman's weakness? What makes Wonder Woman weak? Ah, oh, you say nothing. You haven't done your research. <laughs> Apparently, if you tie her bracelets together, she is useless. Sad, sad but true. Um, what about the Green Lantern? What's his weakness? Yellow. How did you know that? Oh, people don't know that. The Green Lantern sphere is yellow. If you put anything yellow in front of him, apparently he just can't do anything. He falls on the ground in a heap. It's a bit crazy. So here we have, oh, the Martian Manhunter. What's his weakness? Don't know. Haven't heard of him. Fire? Yeah. That's what it is. What about the black canary? What's her weakness? Vanity. Her weakness is vanity. Just pop her a lipstick and she's got to stop and put her. Vanity. This whole cosmic universe has been created in our time. Well, maybe not so much in mine, but some of you, I can say. <laughs> it's been around for a long time. And it is fueled by constant chaos, is it not? Constant chaos. And everything and everyone in it has its weakness. And the DC world at the moment is going through this really dark phase, which I can't help but think is representative 
of where adolescents perhaps are at at the moment, true? We are concerned that everything has this dark side. Above every silver lining is a cloud. And we focus on this and we can dwell on this and it can become part of who we are and of how we work, true? Everyone we look at, we have suspicion. Every opinion that someone has, we question. True? Everything you read, you wonder, is that really true? It's not a comfortable time to live, is it? If we're honest. It's chaotic. To an extent, though, you can find chaos comfortable. Do you know what I mean? Have you met anyone who seems to like to create chaos? It's like they're not alive unless they're in the middle of some horrific plot. Yeah? We may be guilty of that ourselves from time to time. True enough? There is something wrong with the cosmos, just like it was wrong for the Ephesians, just like it's really wrong in the world of DC. Not so bitter and twisted in the Marvel world, but still wrong. And every silver lining has a cloud, and everyone knows it. I want to do something with you now to work through from this point of chaos that you may or may not enjoy, but I'm going to do it anyway. If you can look up on your device or open your Bible, we're going to have a look at Ephesians and deal specifically with the next two chapters, chapters three and four. We're going to read through them together. We're going to look at the cosmic conflict and how Paul addresses this difficulty that the Ephesians had, the Gentiles had, with how they viewed the world. They weren't Jewish. They didn't have this idea of being chosen, of being the ones, of being wonderfully seen by God. They were on the outside. They didn't understand all these things about God. The Gentiles had a different journey to Christ. So do you have chapter three in front of you, Ephesians chapter three? I'm going to read from the NIV and you can follow along on the screen because Brad is going to work through it with us up the back there. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I've already written briefly. In reading this then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. So we're dealing here with Post Jesus, Jesus has been here. He's shown these people who he is, who God is, what he does, the peace that he brings, that he is the antithesis to chaos, that he wants harmony and he wants unity. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. This concept of Gentiles and Israelites together, of there being no male, no female, no slave, no free, constantly comes through in Paul's writings. Because no matter who or what we are or who, how or what we believe, we are together in this. There's no way around that. We are together in this, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me 
to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. How deep, how wide, how long the riches of Christ. This is a silver lining with no cloud. The silver lining just goes on and on and on. And the more you dig, the more there is. And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things, his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. That's not too strong a responsibility, is it? Made known to the heavenly realms by us, together, unified in Christ. According to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's where the responsibility lies. Not us, our Lord. I don't want you going home with a burden. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Who may approach? Who? We. Who is we? Just me and my friends? What about you and the people you disagree with? Can they approach too? Those people who believe strange things, can they approach God with confidence? Should we maybe put a checklist out for them to slow them down, introduce a little bit of chaos into their universe? No. We can all approach with confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. We had the prayer here that Lee read for us earlier. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth, that's us, yes, derive its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That is more silver lining in my mind. that he strengthens us in our inner being. This is not something that's reasoned. This is not a what. This is a how. This is how he does it. He strengthens us in our inner being. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love surpasses knowledge And that you may be filled with the measure and all fullness of ourselves, of God. Do you feel lighter yet? Do you feel relieved from the chaos? Because what fills us is not ourselves, it is God. Even on the cloudiest days, he is still the silver lining. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to whose power? His power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. For how long? How long? Forever. Chapter four. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. And here's the response. And don't take a step back too quickly because it seems that instantly we have responsibility, yes? Did you feel that when I read that first bit? So now, you know, you've got all this really nice stuff. So now, come on. Measure up. Did anyone take it that way? It's hard not to, isn't it? We're so used to fighting to be responsible. Be completely humble. Don't fight. 
Don't add to the chaos. Just be completely humble. And gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of agreement. Through the bond of measuring up to my checklist here that I have for if you want to be with me in my group. Is that what it says? Pardon? Peace. Peace. There is no competition here. There is no chaos here. There is just peace. It is extraordinary, isn't it? We have this whole world that's always at war with itself and at war with each other. And here we have in us, through us, the capacity to be at peace. Is that something you want to hold on to all week, this week? Yeah? Well, you don't actually have to hold on too tight because God's promised it. You just sometimes have to stop and recognise that it's still there. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What about those people you disagree with? What about those people who perhaps take you on at work and work you over? Those people too. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. And what does ascended mean except that he also descended to lower earthly regions, he is the one who descended, he who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. That little verse there, those two verses, they seem a little bit out of place, but I want you to remember the Ephesians. And I want you to remember the cosmology that we touched on a bit earlier, where they had this system of gods who were constantly at war with each other, who were always trying to be better than each other, who were always trying to introduce chaos in order to take control of each other. And Paul includes these two verses, I think, specifically to address that, to say our God is not one who goes off and creates chaos and comes back and beats you over the head with it. That's not our God. That is not how he works. And Paul wants to point this out to the Gentiles and say our God is not one of chaos. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in knowledge of what? Every little thing that there is to know. Doesn't say that. Of the Son of God. That's our goal, that's our aim, is to know the Son of God better and to help and support each other to do that. So verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And I like this next verse because he throws it in and I can't help but see him say, see, this is chaos. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of doctrine and, and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Chaos, yes? The things not of God. These are the cloud. And when you're a child, you get thrown around by everything that happens around you. Did any of you have a perfect childhood? No? You do. You're still a child. Did you see it? Did you want to have that written down just so you can read it back to him when he's older? You said you had a perfect childhood. <laughs> it's a very big compliment, Mum. <laughs> 
We get blown around as children here and there by every wind of teaching and people's cunning craftiness and so on. But God doesn't want that for us. It says instead, has anyone said this to you? I'm going to speak the truth to you in love. And then they've said something really horrible. <laughs> yeah, I don't, think, I don't think that's it. Just in case you're wondering, that is not just an open textbook to give your opinion to somebody. <laughs> Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. So when someone says to you, I want to speak the truth to you in love, or if you say that to somebody, I hope you're going to say something that God would say, like, I love you, I respect you, I permit you your freedom of choice, you are extraordinary just as you are, have peace. Have more peace. This is the truth in love. From the whole body, him who is the head that is from the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The puzzle, those of you who participated, would that have been easier if you weren't all there together? and you didn't know each other, perhaps? Was it more fun like that? It's nicer to do it together, isn't it? In unity, even when you disagree, it's still nice to be sitting there together trying to figure it out. In peace. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking, with nothing but chaos, always expecting the cloud above every silver lining. Don't do that to yourselves. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. It's a trap, isn't it? Chaos? It gets you on a high, it gets your heart pumping and you can walk back into it again and again and again and not realise that your whole life has become chaotic. You, however, did not come to know Christ in that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbour, for we are all members of one body. Do you know what it's wrong to say to somebody? You're not as good as me. You're not as quick as me. You're not as fast as me. You're not as bright as me. You're not as this or that or something else. That's wrong, yes? That is not the truth. That is a lie. To say, you are as loved as me. You are as precious as I am to God. You are as valuable as the other people next to you. You are everything to a God of love. That's the truth. Sometimes that's all we need to hear to make our day better. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and don't give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Imagine how disappointed you'd be if you read that and you were a thief. An Ephesian thief. (laughs) Oh, what? I can't do that anymore. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. 
And do not grieve the Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all, can you say these words with me? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and railing be put away from you with all malice. Next verse. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, even as God also in Christ forgave you. And that's the difference between us and the DC universe and us and the world around us. If we want it to be, that is the difference that we can put aside the bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and every other form of malice and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. I want you to close your eyes for a minute because this is where we finish today. Kids, where are you? Can you sit still and close your eyes? If you need to sit on your parents' lap and have a snuggle, do that. That's it. And I want you all to close your eyes now, everybody. I don't want to see any eyes open. I'll get the teachers out. I want you to have a think and listen I want you to listen to the people around you and I want you to hear your own reactions to them. And I want you to set aside the rage. You may be annoyed because the people around you talked all the way through the service or that your kids didn't give you half a minute to listen, and you spent the whole time saying shh or no. And I want you to replace those thoughts with prayers for them. Can you hear the tiny chatter of little people? The precious chatter of little people? the mumblings of teens and young people who are bored to tears. Pray for them. Pray for each other. Take a deep breath in and out. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Our Heavenly Father, we can get so lost in the chaos of life. We can look at the world around us as being too complicated, too hard, too difficult. And we can see ourselves as being too useless, as lacking worthiness, as not being able to contribute anything good. God, we need you within us to make the difference for us. We need you to be our strength in our weakness. We need your peace to overcome us so that we can have something to share with the people around us that will be a silver lining so that we don't need to see the clouds but that we can perceive and comprehend your love more and more every day. We're so grateful for your presence with us and in us. We thank you for the unity that you bring to us in spite of ourselves, that you can lead us together when we are all so different. 
We praise you for your strength, for your endurance with us, for your persistence in our minds and in our hearts. And we are so grateful that we can be here together. Lord, this week, as our thoughts take us through work, family life, sleep, friends, enemies, give us your silver lining so that we have something to hold on to, to sustain us. That is stronger than all the chaos. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, Annalise is going to finish up our series on Ephesians with chapters 5 and 6. And there are some powerful passages in chapters 5 and 6. So if you have a minute this week to read through them, please do. Thank you all for your participation today. I have enjoyed myself very much. Have a wonderful Sabbath. God bless you.